Okay. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about um, the last uh, eight or nine months of my life that's been uh, uh, involved with the issue of who gets to decide whether genetic testing is reimbursed or covered, whether, uh, which is actually the same or similar question, not the same, but a similar question to um, who decides whether there's sufficient clinical utility uh, in genetic testing to make it worthwhile for private insurance companies or for federal agencies to pay for it. This is a very complicated issue, uh, and I describe it a little bit like the old expression about making sausage. You're not you, you do not necessarily uh, want to know how it's being done, uh, but uh, you do need to deal with it. Uh, these are my disclosures and limitations. There's an enormous amount of rumbling and noise of various kinds. It sounds like elephants tromping through the room. Okay, I'm an officer and shareholder in Invitae, which is a publicly traded company covered by SEC rules. I'm on the National Advisory Council for NHGRI. I've been involved in negotiations with medical insurance companies to bring Invitae in network, so I can only speak in generalities about what is a heterogeneous and complex ecosystem, and most of what I'm going to be telling you is primarily anecdotal evidence based on many hours of conversation with various payers and payer groups. So here's a sausage factory, and he's saying, you're right, I really didn't want to know how it's made, because that was incredibly boring. Uh, and, and as far as anecdotes go, I, I love the fact that there's an enormous amount of feedback. Uh, you, you, uh, wait, wait, please. All right, is that okay? Good, feedback is better. Can you still hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. So anecdotes and data. Uh, here are two conflicting quotes. Well, plural of anecdote is data. Raymond Wolfinger, 1969 and 70. And after that, the plural of anecdote is not data, with a number of people, all of which actually post-date Wolfinger. And so you can take your pick as to whether you like Wolfinger's version or Brinner's version. But what I'm going to be talking to you about today are anecdotes. So who ultimately decides about whether, uh, in sh whether uh, genetic testing is going to be paid for? Well, ultimately, it's the payers, which also includes the federal payers. However, it's a very complex ecosystem of what I call four Ps, which are payers, patients, providers, those are the physicians, the genetic counselors, et cetera, and the purveyors, and that means the laboratory. But even this is just a very small picture of everyone who's involved because behind the payers are the employers who are a major source of the, uh, of the uh, funding for payers. Uh, they cover their employees and have to pay for medical insurance. For the patients, there are patient advocacy groups that to a greater or lesser extent have an impact on this uh, ecosystem. For the providers, I think professional guidelines are a major channel by which providers have input into this system but also both laboratories and providers uh, have a crucial role to play in evidence development. Uh, and of course, patients um, and purveyors can often work together to uh, attempt to develop uh, evidence. And also providers, by constantly ordering genetic tests that they think are medically indicated, even though the insurance companies consider them to be investigational, uh, once that volume gets large enough, it becomes a tsunami of denied claims, uh, the insurance companies have to start t paying attention and taking notice of what's going on. So you can see that there's a lot of interaction among the four Ps. So, payers, they're very heterogeneous in their level of knowledge and sophistication. Uh, I, I've, been, I've been actually quite shocked by uh, 
how little some people in tremendous uh, positions of authority within some of the very large insurance companies, how little they know about genetics or genetic testing, while in other cases, they're fairly sophisticated. Some of the payers use Palmetto MALDX system as a uh, evaluation system for deciding on whether a test is, has analytic and clinical validity uh, and to some extent clinical utility. Private insurance, there are some tech assessment groups, but for many of them, they consider these to be either uh, advisory or they don't pay any attention to them at all. And it's entirely up to the private payer to decide that. Um, I heard repeatedly from my conversations with payers that they feel they've been had or they've been burned in the past by new technology in general and from laboratories in particular by code stacking. And, of course, this all went away with the change in CPT codes from particular procedures like we're doing 15 PCRs and a DNA extraction and a gel and a this and a that to we're doing this test or that test or this panel or that panel. But this is really just a, in its infancy. And anyone who wants to know how infantile it is, uh, just take a look at the, at the most recent Medicare announcement on what they are deciding to do about hereditary breast and ovarian cancer panels versus the testing of just two genes, BRCA1 and 2, which are part of some of the larger panels. Uh, there is not a lot of logic and not a lot of rationale in what they're doing. They're very worried about the cost of testing, but even more so on the misuse of test results, in particular, whether VUSs are going to trigger unnecessary and expensive downstream testing and procedures. I heard this over and over again, that they're afraid to open the floodgates to testing, first because they think it's going to cost them a lot, and to some extent they're fighting the last war because of the code stacking and the fact that genetic testing has cost thousands and thousands of dollars in the past, uh, and this cost has now come down substantially and will continue to come down. But uh, more so than that, they're worried about the downstream radiological tests, procedures, fine needle biopsies, um, electrophysiological tests, and on and on and on that may be um, triggered by genetic testing that is misinterpreted or misused by uh, providers who are not that sophisticated in using genetic testing. In addition, the payers do respond to professional guidelines. They want to see them. And they also respond to the pressure of a tsunami of unpaid claims. Uh, if they're seeing over and over again that the providers in their, uh, that have uh, patients in their network who are uh, ordering a certain test over and over again and are writing letters of medical necessity, they will take notice. But it takes hundreds to perhaps even a thousand such before they will consider a change in their policy. They are under financial pressure from the employers who wish to keep the health premiums down. But also, uh, I should mention that the employers also want to be, um, also have a certain amount of market power with the uh, payers, and that the payers do want to be able to keep these uh, employers in their system, not have them to go off and, uh, and uh, contract with another payer. And so being responsive to those employers not just keeping costs down, but also giving their employees something that the employers consider to be a perk is, is of value. They are looking to partner with labs and with others to provide what they consider utilization management of genetic testing. This is sort of an interesting um, uh, new um, development based on the uh, very long-standing experience with utilization management on the pharmacy side. They're interested in trying to apply that to genetic testing as well. Um, I think there are many laboratories that feel a little bit uncomfortable with putting themselves in the role of utilization management for payers because the laboratories want to stay firmly on the side of or to be in the camp of the providers and the patients and don't want to be viewed too much as being um, uh, direct allies of the payers. At the same time, they want to work with payers and have that be and have the, have the genetic testing be something the payers are comfortable with. So this is a this is a tango. This is a dance 
um, that um, is going on now, uh, I think, quite extensively. Uh, and also the payers are experiencing a lot of financial stress from the Affordable Care Act, uh, and they have a mandate to reduce administrative costs uh, from the Affordable Care Act. And I think you can see the recent raft of mergers and acquisitions that are going on in the payers with uh, Cigna and Humana, for example, um, I think is a clear indication that the payers are starting to consolidate uh, and grow in size in response to the financial stress that they're feeling. Uh, payer coverage with evidence development. I hear this over and over again from people who say, you know, why can't the payers help us develop evidence? And I just want to give you a direct quote from the head of, uh, I won't say which insurance company, but a, uh, a chief medical officer at a very large insurance company. It's not our job to finance your business development. Now, on the labs, where the purveyors, they survive by selling tests. And so there's a financial incentive to develop evidence, but very limited resources to do so. Um, I, was, I was asked specifically at a uh, meeting of a, of a group of, of payers, I won't say which, uh, where I was describing um, our attempts to provide genetic testing using genes that had clear clinical validity, that these were not genes of unknown significance, and that we were um, that these were genes in which there was evidence that there was not only clinical validity but clinical utility. It would change um, it would change provider behavior to have the results of this genetic testing. And one of the people in the audience said, "But how many studies have you done to show that there's economic benefit to the payer community for doing these tests?" Um, the, in the the suggestion being the implication being that it was the laboratory's responsibility to carry out medical economic tests uh, of uh, experiments, medical economic trials of genetic testing in order to demonstrate to the payers that the payers would be saving money if these tests were done. And I think that there are very few payers that can do that. And of course, there is a perverse benefit of patent protection for testing uh, that it did incentivize evidence development. I, you know, maybe ACLU, God forgive me for saying this, but I think it is true that uh, that to a uh, to a significant, not complete, but to a significant extent, a lot of the evidence that was developed over the last 20 years on the role of genetic testing in the management of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer and breast cancer uh, developed because of of uh, resources that were put into this by a laboratory that had a monopoly on that testing and were able to um, monopolize on that monopoly uh, in their uh, pricing and their um, um, uh, profit. There's also, I think, among the labs, an unfortunate tendency to claim low VUS rates. And, and I think they're doing that either from hubris thinking that they can really interpret uh, rare variants about which we know very little uh, better than we really can, or also using it, unfortunately, I think, as a marketing ploy. And this really, this overcalling really feeds payer paranoia. They are upset enough about VUSs and their misuse. They're particularly upset when the VUSs are actually being interpreted as likely pathogenic or pathogenic, which really does trigger a lot of downstream costs. Um, I just want to point out, for example, this article by Van Dries et al. and JAMA, a very, I think, influential and interesting article that arose uh, out of um, the uh, eMERGE group, um, where there was a discordance between long QTS genotypes and the EHR-based phenotypes in an unaffected cohort from the EMR, and that this was designed to simulate incidental findings of long QT genotypes, and the idea was to ask if you do stumble upon genotypes that appear to be likely pathogenic or pathogenic in a, in a group of patients who um, ostensibly were not referred because of what sounds like a long QT type phenotype or event, what do you find? What I find, uh, and, and their interpretation was, that there was very low predictive value of the genotype in these unaffected individuals by looking at the medical record and seeing whether these individuals had anything to suggest a long QT. 
they actually found that they did not, um, and that this was probably due to a lack of penetrance, but I'd like to point out that it could also mean misclassification of the variants by the three laboratories to whom the variants were sent for interpretation. There could also be false negative phenotyping based on the medical record. The medical record has its limitations. Uh, however, I think the misclassification of variants by the three laboratories really needs to be kept in mind uh, as a possibility. For one thing, um, there were very few of the variants in which there was complete concordance on the interpretation. And I think uh, we all know that this is a major challenge to the field, and it causes the payers, uh, I'd say, real heartburn. Now, the providers are academic researchers. They play an extremely important role in evidence development and assessment. Partnerships with labs have and can be very fruitful, particularly in clinical utility and medical economic studies that the labs are in no position to carry out themselves. They do not have direct access to the patients, and these are uh, and economic studies require um, having your fingers into the um, uh, medical um, records and the ordering and the billing of these patients. And there's an alphabet soup of NHGRI and NIH initiatives you're all aware of. They're very valuable. But I have to say that for many of the payers, these carry the taint of the ivory tower uh, about them. Uh, and I think Terry went and spoke at a, at a group recently. I think she was very well received in describing some of the NIH initiatives. So I think this is a, ch this is a changing landscape in their, uh, the payers' willingness to pay attention to some of these sorts of studies. I have two minutes left, and I'm going to say this underscores the special role of integrated systems in evidence development. Places like, like Geisinger, Intermountain, Kaiser, where um, they can um, gather the sort of economic data that I think is necessary. And um, providers, I think we have a real problem with professional guidelines. We need up-to-date professional guidelines that speak with one voice. And any of you who have been working in this field on the cancer side versus the um, uh, cardiology, NCCN is really an, an important, although it's expert opinion to a, to a large extent. Whereas in cardiology genetics, there's a cacophony of guidelines, some of which are, some of which are more than five years old and it's much harder to make a case for guidelines on the cardiology side. Patients, I find, often have an adversarial relationship. They may experience substantial bureaucratic procedures and a string of denials despite paying substantial premiums. And fundamentally, I think much of this arises from a lack of agreement between patients and payers as to what constitutes clinical utility. These two groups have a very different view. So I'm ending here just to say I think there's a complex ecosystem of the four Ps, uh, and um, there is no one pathway to the development of reimbursement for genetic testing. It takes a coordinated effort, which is at this point not very well coordinated. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Bob. Rita's going to type what I'm saying quickly. So we don't type this, Rita. It's, it's too long. Um, so we asked Bob to speak because we felt it was important for everybody to understand the ecosystem that we're actually working in as clinicians. Uh, because you know these tests can't be used if for in large degree unless they can be reimbursed, and and we need the evidence to be able to do that. Um, so we wanted to give you that perspective. Uh, are there? I think we can type and ask one one question or two. Uh, Wendy, make it simple and quick, and then and Callum. Um, so, do you think it would be possible for uh, payers to um, get interested in a possible new type of insurance product whereby uh, oh, gosh, people gosh. who have enough means to drive here and, oh, oh, she's typing it? Um, okay, so new, new insurance product, um, uh, negotiated price for people who can pay interest or not by payers. Yeah, there, there is just an enormous amount of background noise, and I, I could barely understand a word you said. I heard the word negotiate, okay. I heard payer, I heard almost nothing else. I'm, I'm sorry, is there any way? Rita, Rita is typing. Yeah. Do you think it would be possible to get new insurance product negotiations 
pressure to pay. Do you think it would be possible for payers to get new insurance product negotiation prices to pay? Um, well, I, I, I think there's a couple things on the horizon. One, of course, is that the cost of the genetic testing is going down. Uh, and that's the impact of the next generation sequencing and improvement in laboratory and software. The other is, um, I think there is a role to play in uh, patient pay, where you basically bypass the payers and set the price so low that patients believe that they're getting real value and they are willing to pay. This cuts out people of low socioeconomic levels. This cuts out people who do not have uh, available resources, and for them, I think abandoning the payers in 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 order to have patient pay uh, is, uh, I think, an abandonment of a uh, of an obligation that we have. So I do think it's possible to get. Uh, I mean, for example, the BRCA1 and 2 test now being offered um, uh, uh, is a well over a $2,300 reimbursement from Medicare, whereas a panel. Medicare is offering to pay something in the high 600s. So there's already been a huge drop in the price, uh, and I think this is only going to continue. Uh, however, getting the price down is only one part of it. Cle cle cleaning up the VUS issue and relieving them of the worry uh, of downstream is still a big issue. Thank you. Wait a second. <laughs> Hunt and Peck. Yep. Have you spoken to Fifth P Pharma about combining genomics with therapy? Oh, yes, quite a bit. And, um, oh, excuse me just a second. Sorry, um, I, I just have to step for a second. Um, yes, we've spoken to Pharma about combining genomics with, with therapy. They're, they're obviously very interested in this, and I think we really need to start a, a, uh, a movement in the rare disorder community where we make it very clear that patients with rare disorders should know their genotypes. I think the possibility of having crossover of drugs from one disorder to another because of the mutation in that gene rather than which gene it is, is a real possibility. And uh, this is something that pharma is really quite interested in. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye now. <laughs> Bye. All right. Well, that was interesting. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. We'll, we'll send Bob flowers later. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's right. So, so I think at, at this point, did you want to close, close us, Carol? Yeah, sure. Um, I think we do have uh, the next panel, so, and we're pushing uh, past noon. So I think we'll go ahead and break uh, for lunch. We'll reconvene at, uh, at 1 p.m., and uh, Rex will take over the chair. Uh, we'll have a panel discussion and, and lots of time f to follow up on uh, this presentation and uh, the questions that may not have been uh, dealt with in the previous session. So thank you uh, to everyone for speaking and for commenting, and we'll break for lunch.